Hello and welcome. This is module 3 of the course. In this module, we will look at bilingual cognition as in how uh, cognitive mechanisms and bilingualism interact with one another. Now, uh, to do that, we will take three topics uh, to look at this issue. First will be linguistic relativity, then cross linguistic transfer and then the third will be bilingual memory system. So, with the help of these three topics, uh, subtopics within bilingual cognition, we will try to see uh, if we can gather some uh, good, good enough picture about how bilingualism and cognition are interrelated and how what is the nature of the interaction. Okay, so, uh, before we move ahead uh, into bilingual cognition, we need to know what is cognition itself. So, cognition primarily means to know, to understand. So, the collection of mental processes, now understanding and uh, knowing is not a simple process, it has its uh, various layers, various sub processes. So, basically it is a collection of processes that uh, mental processes and activities that are used in thinking, understanding, perceiving, learning and remembering. So, these are, this is the textbook, textbook uh, definition of cognition. So, what is cognition? Cognition basically refers to knowing and understanding. Now, knowing and understanding itself has its many layers. They will include thinking, perceiving, memorizing, learning as well as uh, remembering. So, basically these there are many processes and sub processes. Uh, for the benefit of uh, this course, I have just added few that will be relevant as we will see soon. Learning and memory, thinking and reasoning, language, vision perception and social cognition. Language thus is a, a very crucial aspect within the larger cognitive apparatus. If uh, any of you uh, is interested in knowing about this uh, connection between language and cognition, I have a course on MOOCs, you can check that out. So, uh, the field as it stands today, it has already been established that language functions as a part of the core cognitive mechanism in humans. What do we mean? We have just seen that cognition includes language as one of its primary functions. So, language is part of the core cognitive mechanism as in the fundamental cognitive apparatus that we have. Now, as part of the core cognitive mechanism, language works with in collaboration with uh, other mental processes and other mental functions. For example, attentional mechanism, uh, social cognition, various uh, executive control mechanisms and so on. So, these various parts of cognitive uh, architecture, they cooperate with each other. So, language is one of them which is part of that network. Hence, language does not function in a vacuum, but language is not an isolated phenomena. It is a part of a general purpose cognitive mechanism. That, that bit is already established. Now, these cognitive mechanisms in turn also have their uh, representative uh, or, and respective neural representation in the brain, meaning that each of these functions, each of these outputs that we see also has a specific neural signature, so to say. Sometimes they co-activate, so language functions and certain uh, attentional mechanism functions, they co-activate, meaning certain neural networks, they fire together, they work together. Now, that is the neural aspect of it. So, all of these functions are again connected with the socio-cultural aspects. So, the, the kind of a background within which the language is set that is also an important factor in this entire network. So, language, various other mental functions, neuronal uh, architecture, networks and the socio-cultural setting all of these interact with each other and together they create what we call cognition. So, that is the starting point. So, in other words language is part of embodied cognition. There are two uh, types of uh, cognitive mechanism, one is called the symbolic cognition, the other is embodied cognition. Embodied cognition um, is that uh, understanding of uh, cognitive mechanisms where it is said that various cognitive mechanisms are embodied as in they are dependent on the sensory motor input. So, that is uh, basically how we situate language in this course. Of course, this is very sketchy, but as I said, uh, one can check out other courses. Uh, I also have one course on language and cognition. So, coming back to our topic, the, we are looking at bilingualism and its connection with cognition and how they interact, what are the mechanisms and what are the various uh, relationships. 
So, um, in the 1920s, the British Journal of Psychology published two papers, two very influential papers that uh, kind of set the tone for research for many decades to follow. These papers were both published in 1923, one by Smith uh, on bilingualism and mental development, another was on effect of bilingualism on intelligence. So, the question that both of these papers asked was the how bilingualism and multilingualism can have far reaching impact on other cognitive domain. So, you see in the 1920s itself that is 100 years from today that more than 100 years from today that the question about how language and bilingualism can have impact on other cognitive domains like intelligence, like mental development and so on. So, mental development and other kinds of mechanisms also included language. So, the question basically this particular question has been a very important um, issue to, re to resolve from the perspective of educators, linguists of course and many other uh, types of policy makers. We have seen a bit of it in the initial uh, lectures. So, taking things forward, we now we are in 2022 we will look at bilingual cognition from uh, mainly two main question, two main standpoints. One is the question of the linguistic effect. It is almost a common sense that if you are speaking two languages, anybody who speaks two languages, there will be an in the interrelationship between those two languages. There will be an impact of one language on the other. So, the impact can be from first language to second language or from the second language to first language. It, it works both ways. We will see uh, during this uh, module itself how that works. So, there is a transfer, it is called transfer. So, cross linguistic transfer, transfer of uh, grammatical aspects, transfer of concepts from one language to other, either from one language L1 to L2 or from L2 to L1, it, it happens both ways. Secondly, which is also an important uh, question, is the impact of a new language on cognitive domains, other cognitive domains for example, non-verbal cognition. So, on the one hand we have impact on language itself uh, of one language on the other, on the other hand we have impact of language on non-verbal cognitions. So, this deals with cross linguistic variation in which the bilinguals perceive the world. Okay? So, there are, there are mainly two questions within this broad uh, uh, brush stroke basically. One is do the thought and perception of a bilingual change when they shift from one language to another? There are interesting takes on this. Many uh, researchers have claimed that when you speak L1, you take on an L1 persona and when you speak an L2, you take on an L2 persona. Uh, you can recall our uh, discussion on cultural bilinguals. This is somewhat of that type. So, when you are a bicultural bilingual, a person can shift between uh, L1 and L2 culture, cultural aspects. So, the, you think like an in L2 speaker, you think like an L1 speaker and so on, something of that sort. So, do our fundamental cognitive apparatus, fundamental cognitive mechanisms also change when you change language? That is one question. Second question is whether bilinguals differ from monolinguals of those respective languages. For example, in case of a Hindi English bilingual, is a Hindi English bilingual different from one, a Hindi monolingual and two, an English monolingual or do they behave like monolinguals on both sides? These are questions which has very quite far reaching impact. So, uh, we were talking about how a bilingual's language probably has an impact on his thought process, on his, on the way he looks at the world, on the way he cognizes, how the cognition and language in a bilingual uh, are different from that of the monolingual. So, this is what brings us to the question of language and thought. Now, when we talk about uh, language and thought, relationship of language and thought, this is not merely a linguistic question. This is not uh, only a question for linguists. This is also a very important uh, question in philosophy, for example. Philosophy has for a long time been bothered about how language and thought are connected to each other, what, what is the nature, 
However, we are not going there here in this course we are not talking about primarily from the uh, perspective of language and uh, cognition. So, we are not going into philosophy here. Now, there are various ways of looking at this question. Uh, as far as we are concerned, the primary focus has been um, from linguistic perspective has been on uh, what is called the linguistic determinism or linguistic relativity. Linguistic determinism and linguistic relativity are the same thing, they are uh, calling the same aspect by using two different names. So, primarily what uh, is this refers to is that the point of departure is like this. There are innumerable ways of perceiving the world around us. As many languages are there in the world, that many ways of perceiving the natural world as well as the socio-cultural world that is open to us. So, basically languages differ in how they cut up the same world. This is I quote here cutting up the whole same wall means so everybody has the all of us let us say there is a this, there is a room full of 20 people speaking 20 different languages. Now, what they see all of them are taken to a mountain uh, to, to a hillside and they are looking at the same scene. Chances are very high that each of them will be looking at the same picture. So, physical reality remains the same for each of them, but in their mind they will interpret the scene differently. So, this is what we mean by how we cut up basically we slice basically we color and you know, compartmentalize that knowledge worldly knowledge into our mind and we do that through language. So, basically uh, we, we cut this into concepts and these concepts are then mapped onto what we uh, words in that language right. Now, different languages have different ways of doing this often language A and language B might have a large amount of difference in how they do this, how they carry out this activity. Similar languages may do things similarly with minor differences. Some languages which are different on a where there is a large scale difference, the difference of mapping also may be largely different. So, in other words, each language embodies a, uh, a different worldview. This is very crucial for, uh, to you, for you to understand this whole thing. So, embodiment, embodying a, a concept means what does that concept mean for that person. For example, I will give you a simple example of um, Indian English. In India, anywhere you go, the concept of pickle remains more or less the same. So, the idea of what a pickle is, the concept, the, the reality and the word. So, the mapping of the word pickle on the concept pickle remains more or less similar for all Indians with minor differences here and there, but no large difference. Now, you imagine yourself going to uh, Europe. Many European countries will have uh, various kinds of vegetables put in vinegar or other substances for preserving that. In our Indian pickle also is a way of food preservation, there, theirs also is a food preservation. What is the difference? In the, the let us say German or the Dutch pickle does not have all the ingredients that we do have nor does it have the laborious process involved various you know at every level there is a different sort of process different sorts of oils and spices and so many things. So, pickle is not a simple thing for us which is compared to the Dutch, uh, Dutch pickle uh, it is a vastly different world. So, that is but in both cases the word pickle is used that is what we mean that mapping can be very very different vastly different right. So, this this takes us to a very different. So, an Indian traveling to the west for the first time will be uh, rather surprised uh, if not anything else by looking at their pickle. It would be because the food we, we find their food very uh, bland. So, we, we might as well think that okay a pickle little bit of pickle will help, but it does not help there as, as well. But in any case, so this is a, an example of how languages use words and mapping and, and concept mapping and how languages can be different in that mapping right. So, this view is also called linguistic relativity. So, what is the linguistic relativity idea that languages differ vastly and how languages look at the world determines how you the how, how languages embody the concepts will determine how the people speaking that language will look at the world. This is also called sapir Whorf hypothesis. Uh, because uh, Edward Sapir and Benjamin Lee Whorf were the first ones who 
made this idea very famous. So, linguistic relativism, linguistic uh, determinism or superior of hypothesis they all uh, talk about the same thing that language structure has an impact on the uh, languages are different in terms of their codification and that impacts your way of looking at life. So, before we get get uh, get down to the uh, finer details, let us look at some examples of those differences. Um, this is, uh, so here you have, uh, we have two words in English, you have staircase and ladder. For both of these, Russian has only one word, right? This is, this is from this uh, uh, particular study. Similarly, table and desk are two words in English. However, both of them come under only one word in Russian. Similarly, uh, in Zuni, there is only one word for both orange and yellow, yellow orange and yellow colors in English and this uh, has only one word expression in Zuni language. In fact, this study is, is one of the most well known studies going back to 1956 by Lenneberg and Roberts to show how languages can have different ways of portraying the world. Yet another example uh, from David Crystal's 1987 work. Here you see he worked on uh, an Australian Aboriginal language called Pintupi and you see for the English word whole they have a series of words. They are single words, they are not description. So you see just to uh, for the, uh, the word yarla you have in English there is a whole description. So similarly for all of these, so all of these words need a descriptive sentence in English language that is what we that is what is interesting here. So, this language has one word depictions for different kinds of holes. So, in the ground, in the rock, you know small or what kind of animals have you are, are using that hole and so on and so forth. This kind of differences are, are there not only in the at the word level but also at the grammatical level and syntactic level. A very influential pep, uh, work again by Borodetsky and her, uh, her collaborators in 2003, they show that the English lang English sentence, the elephant ate the peanuts, this in this sentence, uh, this is basically a sentence that depicts the time of the event. So, this happened in the past. So, you English has eat it. So, you have mentioned, so the event in the past tense is mentioned. So, English only takes care of that part. If you have to express the same concept in Mandarin, for example, now, you, the, your um, indicating the time of the event is optional. You do not need to specify the time when the eating happened. Let us go to Russian. Russian will include tense marking, elephant gender and whether it ate all or some. So, the amount of peanuts that the elephant ate also has to be grammatically explicitly mentioned in the sentence. So, basically the Russian equivalent of this sentence will have all these extra information included in that. In Turkish, it also needs to indicate whether the event was witnessed or it was hearsay. So, when somebody says the elephant ate the peanuts, is did the person see it happening or did he hear it from somebody else? You see that is the kind of difference, that is the kind of range of differences languages may have. Now given this kind of and there are of course many other such studies, these are some of the most well known ones. Now given this data, most of the researchers agree that yes, languages are different. There are lots of differences in terms of concept and word mapping and concept and grammatical structure mapping. So, by implication different um, speakers of different languages may attend to different aspects of the same world. For example, when you are, when you are a, a Turkish speaker, you need to be constantly aware about whether yeah, every sentence you are, you are saying, you have to be aware of the fact that one needs to mention the, uh, mention whether the event was witnessed or was it a hearsay. So, that is what we mean by attending to. We will see this is also called habitual thought, how languages can affect our habitual thought process. So, there so far so good there is no dispute in till here. 
before we go to the dispute before we go to the uh, quarrel we let us let us see a little bit more. So, why may additional language affect cognition? We have seen that languages differ on various uh, levels uh, in, in terms of mapping concepts into the language. So, why where does it all start? So, technically speaking there are two issues here one is the issue of codability. So, what is codable? What do we mean by codability? Codability basically refers to that language is basically a code, it is a system, it is a it is a symbolic way of referring to things in the world. So, what do we care to symbolize and what do we not care to symbolize is what takes us to the issue of codability. So, is the idea of uh, whether the concept of witnessing versus hearsay is a codable idea or not is where the difference between Turkish and English remains. In English you do not have to codify, you do not have to say anything whether you saw the elephant eating the peanuts or not it does not really matter. In English sentence it does not really matter, in Turkish it matters. So, that is what is codability. So, what is codable in one language? Second is the idea of habit habitual thought. So, whatever is codable depending on what you code what is uh, codable in your language will in turn affect your habitual thought process. How does it work? Let us see. First and foremost languages code concepts lexically. We just saw in case of the uh, about the work by Crystal where there are 8, 9 different terms for the single English word whole. So, that is what it means. So, code uh, concepts lexically. So, concepts are mapped onto words this is this is how it works right. In other words some concepts are grammaticalized for example that is expressed morphologically or syntactically in one language but not in other language. So, codability primarily refers to that some languages care to grammaticalize certain concepts. So, certain concepts are grammaticalized. It means certain concepts are uh, either they have a lexical item for this or uh, sometimes they will have a in the structure in the syntactic structure itself there will be uh, the concepts will be grammaticalized like in like in case of Turkish or in case of uh, Russian for example in the previous case. So, what does it mean having a grammaticalized concept basically means that you have a readily available lexical term in case of uh, lexical uh, term in, in case of words. So, another example here is that of Alaskan language then Atina has this has different verbs. So, for the simple concept simple in English concept of trees growing on the sides of the mountain mountain slopes trees growing on the mountain slopes this language has different lexicon for you see how many types. So, on the slope growing on the upper mountain side growing up a mountain in strips. So, depending on the position in the mountain where exactly the, the trees are growing in what kind of shape, what kind of uh, patches they form and so on depending on that they will have different words. This is not possible in English, not possible in English what do we mean by that? It means that in English there is no single word lexical item there is no single word for this you need to describe you see how we have described growing on the upper mountain side in, in the Naina there is only one word for that concept. Similarly, there are um, th there are also sometimes different ways of segmenting a continuum continuum can be color continuum can be time continuum various uh, things like this. So, we we, we segment time into past present and future tense we segment colors into uh, blue and purple and dark blue light blue and so on and so forth. Uh, you also have words like uh, mauve and uh, uh, lilac and so on and so forth. So, basically what we are doing is we are segmenting the color continuum into discrete units. So, this is another case where you will find a lot of cross linguistic difference variation. So, uh, one classic example is that of uh, English and uh, Italian. In Italian there is a word called azuro uh, which basically refers to light blue in English. Of course, now we uh, do use azure as a, as a term, but initially English did not have that as a single word concept. So, speakers of English speak English learning Italian are expected to 
learn new concepts through a new level or word. Similarly, some concepts are purely linguistic, purely linguistic as in it has no uh, real world ramification. For example, in some languages, in uh, another language, uh, another aboriginal language, women fire and dangerous things, other many other dangerous things are put under the same category of objects, same category of nouns. So, this, this is done with the use of a classifier which is of course based on some kind of a culture specific property. It is not necessarily a real life uh, property of women and fire and other dangerous things that decides. So, some sort of a specific culture specific idea that gets grammaticalized in terms of some kind of in, in this case it is a classifier in some other cases it can be something else. Now, this is something that the L2 learner has to learn. So, if, if an, a learner so L1 does not have these concepts and L2 does, then the person has to learn those concepts and their mapping. And that in turn will of course, have some impact on the habitual thought process. Habitual thought process uh, basically is that habitual use of language that can influence our thought that is uh, simple. For example, many linguistic practices are uh, have to do with the socio-cultural uh, systems. For example, in Hindi and many other languages, uh, you have the, the pronouns have a three-way differentiation in terms of honorific system. So, in honorific uh, pronoun system in, in Hindi has tu, tum and ap difference which is the case in many Indian languages. So, tu starts at the, at the lowest level which you use for uh, tu is basically you. So, in Hindi you have tu, tum and aap all the three correspond to the you in English language right. Now, here tu is basically used with somebody who is either younger to you in age or it is also used with somebody who is subordinate or uh, to somebody to the speaker. So, even if somebody is um, uh, older in age, but lower in the social strata, tu is often used. Tum is used for close relationships within the family, among friends, among equals and so on. Up on the other hand, it is used for, uh, for people who are either older to the speaker or they are superior in the hierarchy, in the social hierarchy of, of things. Now, this will, this is, this appears very simple in terms of grammar, but it is not so simple when it comes to your communicative competence, when you have to speak in that, in that scenario, in the social scenario. So, for example, tum lambi ho and aap lambe hai, by the way, this, uh, the pronoun here agrees with the verb. So, depending on how, uh, what pronoun you use, the verb also changes. So, tum lambi ho and aap lambe hai are simple, like the both mean the same thing. Semantically, they, they are just referring to somebody uh, who is taller than the speaker. However, depending on age or uh, social hierarchy, the, the pronoun changes. Now, this is not only the case of uh, only age, but the, there can be a complex mixture of things. So, somebody who is um, younger to you in age, but, but much superior in social strata and hierarchy and so on, the app can be used. So, which means that you cannot ignore the addressee in, in any conversation setup, the addresses, age and social st uh, status and so on, you have to constant, you have to be watchful. So, that feedback system is stronger in case of Hindi as opposed to in case of English. So, when you are speaking in English, you do not really need to worry about all of these. This is another. So, habitual, your habit in Hindi speakers have this uh, as part of their habitual thought, which is not the case with English. Similarly, in uh, English versus Japanese studies, I uh, have uh, looked at a, a slightly different issue. In case of English, pronouns cannot be dropped. Right? So, pronouns have to be used. So, I ate pasta yesterday, it is impossible to use ate pasta yesterday. In Japanese, however, it is perfectly possible to say uh, ate pasta, you do not need to use the pronoun similar to Hindi, similar to um, 
uh, many Indian languages. So, in Hindi, it is perfectly fine to say pasta khaya, even in Bangla and other Indian languages also. So, it is it is okay, but in English, it is not it is not uh, uh, possible even. Now, there has been a very interesting study connecting this uh, pro drop pronoun dropped languages and um, with the, with the societal system. So, this uh, study by Kashima in 1998, they have proposed that people living in those countries where pronoun drop languages are spoken tend to have more collectivist values than those who use non pro drop languages. So, more collectivist values as opposed to more individualistic value. This is a very, a very interesting uh, take on this whole idea of uh, using or not using pronoun in a sentence. So, they say that the explicit reference to you and I, this probably remind the speakers of the distinction between self and the other. Quite an interesting take there, but just to show you how languages and uh, their grammaticalized concepts can differ in, uh, to a large extent and what all they might even imply. So, so far things are fine, we see that languages differ, their codification system differs as a result the habitual thought process may also differ, that is all fine, well attested and well studied. Then where is the problem? The problem is when we make claims on the basis of that difference. That is where the stronger version of the linguistic relativity hypothesis comes in. The stronger version says that language determines the way we see the world. So, if your language has a particular structure, we are obliged to look at the world through that lens only, right. So, this means that languages affect non-linguistic cognition, non-verbal cognition in a very significant way. You take this thing one step ahead and it means that it implies that those languages which does not have codified uh, lexical items for certain concepts will also not be able to grasp those concepts. For example, if Eskimo has a large number of words for snow, varieties of snow and English has only two snow and ice, English speaker will not be able to distinguish between those different types of snow. That is the claim. So, if, if your language does not have the word for a particular concept, it will be very difficult for the speaker of that language to grasp, to understand, to learn that concept. That is the strong claim that linguistic relativity uh, seems to make. So, basically grammatical structure or syntactic structure or semantic structure of a language has either facilitatory or inhibitory effects on understanding concept. Now, we need to unpack these words. What is facilitatory versus inhibitory? Facilitatory as it as the name suggests that if your language has a large number of words for finer nuances within a bigger concept, that means this helps you understand those concepts better. So, an Eskimo because the language has let us say 20 words for snow, then the Eskimo children when learning the language, they will have a better access to those fine grain differences within that concept. Okay. On the other hand, the inhibitory effect basically talks about that if your if uh, a language does not have the uh, words, if a language does not have uh, so many grammaticalized uh, codified way of looking at a concept, then it will be very difficult for that person to uh, for that speaker to learn that language, learn that concept. This is the primary claim. Now, this is where the entire dispute is or let us call it debate or uh, disagreement and hence this big since this is a big claim to make and the initial strong claims were discarded almost immediately. However, later on uh, following cognitive revolution in the 50s uh, and 60s, a lot of uh, a new wave of looking at the same question, age old question started. This is called the neo-warfism, neo-warfism as in a new way of looking at the uh, linguistic relativity hypothesis. Now, the standpoint is that you do not uh, go by the strong version of it as in that language uh, does not probably determine the way you look at the world, but it does have some sort of an impact. That is where the neo-warfism slightly differs from the uh, older version. So, the newer version is also called the weaker version of the linguistic relativity hypothesis. 
So a lot of studies have tried to look at whether this is the case, whether um, how languages codify a concept and in case of a bilingual if that, that uh, codification has either helped him or you know uh, stopped him from learning a new concept and how what is the, the what are the dynamics. So one of the early studies by Bloom in 1981 looked at a very in, uh, interesting con construction in English language which is called counterfactual conditional. Counterfactual conditional is a conditional that describes the consequences of events that did not happen. So for example, these are the two examples that he has given. If John had seen Mary, he would have known that she was distraught. Okay? John did not see Mary, that is the implication of this sentence. Second sentence, if John saw Mary, he knew she was distraught. We do not know whether John saw Mary. These are the two possibilities of codifying this difference in the understanding with respect to John. Whether you know John did not say Mary or whether you did, do not know. Depending on this, this the consequences will vary. And how do you grammaticalize this difference in concept? This is how, this is how you change the sentence structure to mean two different things. Now this is a very subtle difference in English language. This is called counterfactual conditional. Now Chinese language does not distinguish between these two possibilities, these two types of conditional, either lexically or grammatically. And so gives no information whether the event happened or not. In English, you know whether it happened or not, at least understanding of the concept will be clear. In Chinese, it is not clear, it is not mandatory to use that. So taking this as a starting point, Bloom created a counterfactual story about what would have happened if a philosopher named Bear had used known Chinese and then he asked Chinese speakers to answer questions on the story. So a, a, a non-Chinese person learning Chinese and then asking the Chinese speakers about certain stories or certain questions about that story. Now Chinese monolingual speakers did not interpret the story counterfactually because counterfactual conditionals is not even a thing to be talked about, it is not, it's not does not even exist in Chinese language. So they do not have to worry about it and hence they did not answer the questions keeping this factor in mind. However, those who knew English, Chinese speakers who learned English as an L2, they did they used counterfactual argument more often in their language structure. So this is one of the earliest and clear evidence of <clears throat> the effect of bilingualism on cognition. So that once you have started learning and, and the new language, you are incorporating the conceptual and aspects and grammatical aspects of that language into your first language also. So there is a slight adjustment in your non-verbal communication as well. So you are thinking slightly differently that the L2 speakers of Chinese, L2 English speakers of Chinese L2 English speakers were using counterfactual arguments more often than monolinguals, meaning that there is a slight change in their thought process. So this is what uh, one of the first studies. The studies that followed after this, there are many, many different domains within which this bilingual cognition has been looked at. Uh, some of them are of course, we can divide these uh, studies into two categories looking at um, uh, two different aspects. One is the perceptual and sensory aspect. So the kind of sensory input uh, that we get from the world and how that is coded in the language that is one. Another is the grammatical aspect, um, grammatical and syntactic structure, structural differences. All right. So uh, let us go to the perceptual and sensory experiences first sensory aspects first. Color cognition has been one of the most important um, domains, one of the most important um, topics for understanding cognition, language and cognition among, among different groups of people and also uh, in terms of bilingual cognition. So because color is such a thing that um, basic color terms differ across languages in the world. So languages differ from having 2 basic colors to 11 basic colors. Right. So, Berlin and Kay's landmark study on 
color terms across world languages have found this. Now, some languages so the minimum color terms you can have is 2 and the maximum they found were uh, was 11. Now, this has been as a result a very uh, rather traditional uh, test set for verbs idea to see if languages that have less number of color terms are incapable of distinguishing those colors in real life that is basically what the entire study has been. Now, I mentioned Zuni in a few slides back that Zuni has uh, only one term for orange and uh, yellow whether English has two. Similarly, many languages have one term for blue and green together. So, one, one term refers to both blue and green. In English, we have two words. Similarly, many other languages have this kind of Papua. One language in Papua New Guinea has only two color terms, dark and light. So, dark includes a lot of dark colors, light includes a lot of light colors. Now, if that is the scenario, if a language has very few color terms in its vocabulary, does it mean that you that, that person that uh, speaker of that language cannot grasp the color differences if it is shown to them without asking them the names forget about the language but color do they identify the subtle nuances of color difference this has been the uh, study that um, that has been carried out by a number of uh, researchers so uh, Berlin and K as I said uh, have studied this in uh, in depth and they claim that Despite the way languages name colors, there, there must be something universal in terms of those the representation of those colors in the human mind. And this is, this is uh, because the physical property of color itself as you all know color perception the what with what colors we see and how we see them does not depend on language right. Color perception is primarily a matter of biology and physics basically wavelength and the way those wavelengths uh, lights of uh, wavelengths are, are interpreted by the visual apparatus human visual apparatus. So, basically the, that remain more or less the same. So, how is it possible that humans will not see certain colors until and unless you are color blind but otherwise in normal cases. So, that is the same claim that he made that color of property itself is universal in terms of its biology and its physics. So, they devised uh, many studies and they proved that participants from um, diverse cultural and linguistic backgrounds showed English like color naming and prototype identification. So, basically what he means in at that time they called it English like color naming and prototype identification basically um, with a bit of training if you if you train them that this uh, this language is called this, this is called uh, this, this uh, color is called this and so on with a bit of slight training those people are perfectly fine at learning those terms. So, one on the one hand it is perfectly possible to teach color terms different color terms to people who earlier did not have them that is one. Secondly, the prototype. So, what is blue? Typically what is used in these cases is, uh, is called Munchal color chip we will show I will show it to you uh, slightly later. So, in the color chips there are the colors are different in terms of hue and brightness. So, where what is blue is there is a prototypical blue for an English speaker for similarly for other speakers what is a blue what is a green. So, if you have only one word for blue and both blue and green that word the exact mapping of that word and the concept and the exact color might be different from that of another language which has different words. So, that also changes. So, not only the speakers uh, learn, can learn new words, uh, they can also adjust their prototypes of those different colors that is what they found which means that even though languages may differ in terms of uh, vocabulary in a certain domain and that might have some impact on their cognition however, it, it is open to changes. So, they are capable of grasping. So, the stronger version of the linguistic uh, relativity hypothesis is not tenable is what they found. So, this was taken as a proof of universalism as in the color understanding color perception is universal. These subjects were immigrants to US with varying degrees of acculturation and proficiency in English. So, as the English proficiency goes up the color perception also changes that is what they found. Another important study by Irwin on Navajo English bilinguals 
that was carried out in 1961 showed that acquiring another language can lead to a shift in naming and prototype identification similar to what we have found before. Another interesting study carrying the Irwin's findings ahead was Athanopoulos, Athanosopoulos um, on Greek English bilinguals. This is uh, comparatively recent. Now, he had he was looking at um, a very interesting concept because Greek has a two way distinction in blue. One is called blue that is dark blue and that is galazo which is light blue. Now, these two are quite far away in the Munchal color chips. These two colors are rather far away both in terms of hue and darkness. They were trying to see if this concept, so the prototype of what is galazo and what is uh, blue will it change if they start learning English language? That is the question that they asked because Greek monolinguals know this difference very, very clearly. How will it be modified if they start learning English as their second language? So, they, they chose their participants very carefully. They had two levels of proficiency. One group had uh, initial level of proficiency, another group had high level of proficiency. So, low proficient versus high proficient uh, bilinguals, Greek English bilinguals. The high proficient uh, bilinguals were living in, uh, the, they were Greeks living in UK and the low proficients uh, were uh, living in Greece and they are learning English. Now, the task was to point to the best example. Best example is the prototype of that term. So, what is the prototype of Ble and what is the prototype of Galazo is the question. Right? What is the best example of these two in the color chips? They were not asking about English language at all, nothing. The English proficiency is a background information. Right? They had to, this was a non-linguistic task, they had to find out the prototype. Now, in low proficient bilinguals showed a tendency to put Ble away from blue focus, blue as in English blue. Okay? What color is when we say blue, when English speakers say blue, that it has a very different prototype as opposed to ble in Greek. So, low proficient monolinguals, low proficient Greek English bilinguals basically behave like Greek monolinguals in that their ble and galazo were far apart. So, ble was put quite away from a English uh, prototype of blue. Whereas, high proficient uh, group tended to put ble closer to the blue focus. So, the Keyword here is proficiency. So, the low proficient versus the high proficient and low proficient uh, Greek English bilinguals behave like Greek monolinguals. On the other hand, high proficient Greek English bilinguals had their color perception closer to English monolinguals. All right. So, this is also this uh, the, uh, his findings support uh, Irwin's findings. So, this is how a Munchal color chip looks, color chart looks. This can have various um, uh, modifications, but primarily this is what it is. So, there are two levels of difference on this side and this side. So, hue and brightness difference and on the basis of that you can call this is let us say 5 and you have C here. So, this is 5 C. Similarly, there is a, a 8 or 10 G will be this color. This is 10 G like this they are marked. Okay. So, how uh, each color has a name depending on this, uh, these two variables. So, this is how the study by Athanasopoulos looks. Uh, in case of for a Greek, Galazo is basically 5b on that chart, 5b will refer to will be what is Galazo and then uh, monolingual uh, Ble is here, right. So, that is where Galazo and this is where Ble is. So, this is 5pb, pb is purple blue. So, pb and 5b you can see the difference between these two color words. However, in case of English monolingual blue this is what 10b is the English monolingual blue prototype. Do not go by the slight color the colors are not here I am just uh, showing you the numbers. Okay, So, it, this is actually green uh, in the slide this is green and white, but I uh, just focus on these numbers. So, 10b is English blue the prototypical blue in English language refers to 10b on that chart. Right? And prototypical galazo refers to uh, sits in the 5b position and prototypical ble sits in 5pb. This is the distribution. 
Now, what happened with low proficient Greek speakers of English? Their galazo and blay were like this. However, the high proficient bilinguals put their blay here and galazo here, right? So, both have moved, both have kind of converged towards 10b. However, there is a slight difference here, okay? What is the difference? Even though their color categories, high proficient uh, English. Uh, L2 speakers, uh, L2 English speakers, uh, Greek speakers who speak English as L2 and who are high proficient, their colors both Galazo and Blay have moved closer to English blue. However, an interesting thing here is that even in advanced bilinguals, they have still maintained the distance between the two. As you can see, even if they have come closer, they have not come here. Only Blay has come here, Galazo has remained much higher in the darkness versus lightness category. So, that is the thing that even though there is a, uh, there is a convergence on one side, there is also they have kept the differences to some extent in the uh, in their prototype. So, this is uh, uh, this is the color, this is the domain of color. Now, let us move on to another perceptual sensory uh, uh, aspect of language which is the uh, domain of pitch, pitch, tone uh, so on. So, this is uh, very interesting because uh, depending on the tonal properties of one language, the tonal properties of either L1 or L2, the perception of those things in the other language can change. So, language typically has a, a link to a pitch perception. This is very every language has its own um, chart in that uh, domain. So, this has um, the work on language and pitch perception has shown that differences of Perceiving the same pitch level differently by speakers of different languages differs on the pitch range of the first language. So, if your L1 has a different pitch range, chances are very high that one will carry that over to the second language and perception of the second language pitch variation will depend on the first language's pitch variation map. So, as a result, bilinguals perform differently in this task as opposed to monolinguals. So, this has been used, uh, this idea has been used also to look at uh, the, per the uh, music, understanding and perceiving of musical tones. Um, uh, most in, one of the most important studies in this uh, domain is that by Mang 2006 on Cantonese English bilinguals. They found out that Cantonese English bilinguals are more in tune while singing in English than their English uh, monolingual peers, than English speaking children. And this was attributed to the fact that Cantonese is a tonal language. Many, many tonal language in, in uh, Chinese, both Mandarin and, and Cantonese are tonal language. So are many uh, languages in Northeast India. The, the tone, what do we mean by tonal language? Here tone has a uh, grammatical property. So the same grapheme, but with different tones will be different words that is what it means. So, if a language is a tonal language, chances are that that speakers of that language will also have a higher perception, higher uh, uh, better ability of handling musical tone. This is another interesting domain of study that takes care of the bilingual cognition of these things into consideration. Again, we have something called uh, the taste terms. So, taste terms are more or less universal. There are four uh, taste terms in western languages there are four some languages may have one or two extra so in japanese and chinese for example they have another taste concept which is called umami now this is something that one will not understand until and unless you have tasted something that that falls in that category right so this is kind of a combination of savoriness and meaty taste some kind of a combination of this type However much we try to describe this taste, it is impossible for somebody to perceive it as exactly what it is until and unless you have tasted that thing which has this taste. So, studies have found that English learners of Japanese language could learn this concept after exposure to the culture and the food, actual food sampling. Before that it is very difficult for you to categorize. So, if an English speaker is learning Japanese, he has to learn that there is a different fifth taste term, basic taste term called umami 
and then if you uh, expose the learner to the actual food item which has this test, it will be the, the speaker has been able to learn this. So, primarily what we have seen, uh, let us summarize in uh, color in terms of color, pitch and taste. Color cognition has been a very important domain. So, color cognition has uh, shown us that even though languages may differ a great deal in terms of the basic color terms in that language, however, that does not stop one person from learning the new. If the second language has more number of words, more lexicalized uh, and grammaticalized uh, concepts uh, and more finer nuances within that category, with some training it is possible to learn. Another finding from color category, color cognition studies among bilinguals is that it that is also a shift. Bilinguals make a shift in their uh, prototypes, color prototypes in terms of uh, adjustment by adjusting them with the L2. Some uh, whether it is English Navajo English speakers or it is Greek English speakers, similar findings have been found out, uh, similar findings have been reported that basic color categories, the prototypes of a color in a particular color term can change, there can be some shift. We will discuss this more in detail when we talk about conceptual transfer in the next segment. Now, now let us move on to the grammatical concepts. Now, grammatical concepts as we have seen include uh, the concept of gender, grammatical gender, number, uh, tense marking and motion verbs. So, starting with gender, this is uh, a rather interesting domain and it has been uh, studied by many researchers, many groups of researchers to, to take the connection between language and thought. Languages, so what is gender in terms of grammar? Uh, when we say grammatical gender, what we mean is that languages have, uh, yeah, languages use gender marking on their nouns, nouns, adjectives, sometimes even verbs take the gender marking. So, there are three possible genders but as far as grammars go masculine gender, feminine gender and neuter. This is still here things are fine. Often if the noun is animate and then the gender marking and the object and the referent they share, there is a close relationship. So, a boy is of course will take a masculine gender and uh, you know many languages. English is not a gendered language but in Hindi uh, and many other Indian languages are gendered language. So, on the one hand you have animate of animates plus human minus human any kind of animates they will have a gender. So, natural biological entities have their genders. So, when gender marking is mapped on to the real life gender this is called a close correlation. However, some languages do not have this close correlation. What do we mean by that? We mean that in some languages inanimate objects can also have a gender marking. So, inanimate objects can be either masculine or feminine or neuter, there are all kinds of possibilities. So, this is where it gets really interesting. So, in some cases there is a close relation uh, between the gender marking and the biological gender that is when it is uh, in, in tune with the real world. So, gender marking of, uh, of on the world also has a gender object, the entity also has a biological gender. Sometimes they do not have a biological gender. Some examples here, it's the uh, Spanish, German, Russian for example, they are they have gender marking on inanimate objects. Now, when gender marking happens on inanimate objects, you can imagine that this is very arbitrary, there is no rhyme or reason whatsoever as to why a chair should be masculine in one language, feminine in another language, neutered in another language and so on. So, an example here. The sun in English, this has masculine gender in Spanish, it has feminine, the same object has feminine gender in German and it has neuter in Russian. This is what we mean by arbitrary. So, grammatical gender without biological gender is a rather arbitrary thing. This mapping is arbitrary as to why it is called. Now, this naturally as one can expect has triggered a lot of interesting studies. One of them, one of the older studies uh, goes back to 1983. They were trying to see if the gender load in a language understanding will help acquiring gender identity in any way. Uh, this is for children. So, when children are growing up learning a language in a language environment, depending on the language whether it is a gendered language or not, not a gendered language, 
does it have any connection with how quickly the child learns gender identity that is the question that they were trying to figure out. So, the subjects were children aged between 16 to 42 months and um, the environment was monolingual environment. This is not a bilingual study, this is a monolingual study. So, monolingual environment uh, of Hebrew, English and Finnish languages. Now, the choice of these three languages were based on the gender load. Is it heavily gendered language or is it sparsely gendered or is it or whether the language has no grammatical gender, right? So, the Finnish has the least uh, load, Finnish has no grammatical gender marking on inanimate objects, Hebrew has the highest load, Hebrew, Hebrew has obligatory gender marking for all inanimate objects, English typically is somewhere in the middle. So, that is why they chose these three languages and all the children were tested in monolingual environments. Now, the task was Michigan uh, gender identity task, uh, they had to find out whether the uh, the child is capable of identifying gender from that kit and the findings suggest that gender loading correlated with gender identity alignment. So, if the language that the child is exposed to, if the language in the environment has a gender load meaning it has a it is it has grammatical gender, chances are high that they will learn gender understanding identity much quicker. Now, this is another old study uh, in more recent times 2003. Borodetsky et al. They had taken this question a step ahead and they asked it if a speaker uses a language with grammatical gender, does it make or mislead him into thinking those objects have real gender? Meaning, if you have, let us say, you, are, you, are you speak a language that uses grammatical gender for inanimate objects, does it make the person that is, does it make you? look at those objects as if they are actually masculine or as if they are actually feminine. That is the question that Brodisky asked and this they took to bilingual, they had um, Spanish English and German English bilinguals. The choice of Spanish and German here is very interesting, uh, they were tested separately because Spanish and German are languages which uses opposite gender marking for the same objects. So, there is a long list of nouns that have opposite gender in Spanish and German. That is why they had taken Spanish English and German English bilinguals. The task was they were given subjects were given 24 objects and uh, the, the ob object names. Now, these were objects that had opposite gender in Spanish and German and the task was to name first three adjectives that come to their mind. So, as soon as you hear bridge, what comes to your mind? The reason why the, they had uh, asked them to use first three to so that you do not get to really think automatic reaction, this was automatic processing. So, bridge, what do you think of bridge? Keys, what do you think of keys? House, what do you think of house? You know like that. So, ad adjectives for those 24 items. Now, as I said, those 24 items were cleverly uh, chosen because they had opposite gender in Spanish and German. Now, for both the subject groups, the output language was English. They were not using either Spanish or German. The language of the experiment was English. What do you expect the result to be? The result is as expected. The groups used adjectives depending on what gender their L1 assigns to that object. So, if the bridge is feminine in one language, they have used um, uh, words like elegant, slender, beautiful uh, or versus if it is masculine in the L1, they have used sturdy, strong, intimidating, things like that. So, from this uh, study, we concluded that there is a, the, the gender marking does have an impact on your non-verbal cognition in terms of uh, gender and, in, and this also gets transported from your L1 to L2. So, because the target language in this case was L2, it was English for both the groups. However, because those languages that their first languages had gender marking, English does not have gender marking, even then, even then the gender understanding, this is what they spoke about misleading him into thinking that these concepts have real gender. This is, this is the proof that they, they tried to 
that they have uh, shown us that this probably made them think that those objects actually have gender and this is th that is why they use those adjectives. There are many other studies by the way there are for the reason of brevity I could not include all the studies and their uh, results in this. There are many many studies in this for each of these domains I will include all the references one can go and find out uh, one can read on. I also try to upload the papers as much as I can. All referring to all the papers is uh, not possible within this uh, time frame. Another interesting domain that have been studied is the domain of grammatical number. Grammatical number as in the singular versus plural number. So, many of the languages in the world they have a singular versus plural. Some languages also have a dual number uh, which is not very common. So, singular versus plural. So, when there are more than one item we use a plural marker that is what we call number grammatical number marking system in a language. Now, what does it depend on? It depends on two primary factors. One is of course, number whether there is uh, one or more than one. However, there are two more things that is one is called discrete, the other is animate. So, plus minus discrete as in if there are individual entities possible within that category. So, there are there is one house, many houses. So, house is a discrete thing. It is an one individuated item, right. So, there can be one house and there can be many houses. So, that is what that is the idea of discrete. Animate by plus minus animate. So, whether the entity referred to is animate versus it is inanimate. Now, combining these two uh, possibilities, there are primarily three categories that are there. So, you have plus animate plus discrete things like cat, dog, tree, etc., things that are living things, all right. And then you have minus animate plus discrete. So, things that are inanimate objects like book, table, building and so on. And then there is a third category where you have things that are neither animate nor they are discrete like water, sand and floor etc. As you can already imagine that in English this is a separate category and these two are a separate category, right. So, in English both the first categories take plural markers. So, in both cases, so you have cats, houses, books, men like this. So, both animate as well as inanimate objects if they are discrete entities, they can be pluralized as in they can take a grammatical number marking. However, for the third category because it is not discrete, it is neither discrete nor animate. So, we have something called a unitizer unitizer as in you have to make create some sort of a unit. So, you have a glass of water, you have sack of flour and so on because you cannot have many waters, many flours that is not possible. So, you need some sort of a unit. So, the glass is one unit, sack is one unit right like that. This is for English. Some languages however, are rather different in this regard. So, some uh, most famous examples are of course, the Japanese and the Yucatec language. So, in case of Japanese animate plus animate plus discrete the number marking is optional it is not obligatory. Like in English you must differentiate between one cat and two cats in Japanese it is optional you do not need to. And it gets even more interesting when you have minus animate plus discrete. So, cannot take number marking nor it can be preceded by a numeral. So, these then how do you quantify in this language? You would use a classifier. Now, these classifiers are semantically unspecified, semantically unspecified as in they do not specify the individual units, right. They are not individuated. There is no individuality about the thing. It is just a classifier that talks about the uh, entity that the substance. So, the focus here is more on substance than on the individuated entity. So, keeping this in mind there have been many studies as I have been uh, quoting only the most well known ones among among the most well known ones. So, Athanasopoulos 2006 he studied um, intermediate and advanced Japanese learners of English since we are talking about bilingualism. So, the, he looked at Japanese English bilinguals and what happens to their number marking system and understanding of those things uh, in K, uh, by differentiating between intermediate learners and advanced learners. Intermediate learners um, the expectation is they will behave more like Japanese monolinguals and advanced learners will be closer to English monolinguals. 
just like we saw the Greek English bilingual study. So, what was the task? Task was a set of six pictures, six uh, drawn pictures. Now, each containing nouns in any of the three categories, like we saw already discrete, based on discrete and animate uh, criteria. So, they had animals, they had implements, that means minus animate plus discrete, and they had substances, neither animate nor discrete. Right? So, these three categories of objects were depicted in through pictures in those cards. Each set had six pictures. Now, the task was it was a picture matching task. So, one picture was um, by the way this, this task was produced by Lucy in 1992. Uh, so, the target picture needed to be matched to the most like. So, there was a target picture one picture let us say picture one and they had to make find the closest match to that picture from among the other five pictures that was the idea that was the task. Now, the results uh, showed what we have all what we already know what we already can predict that intermediate learners behave like Japanese monolinguals in terms of understanding. So, that difference is blurred in terms of because the, there is no number marking there is no distinction in terms of those animacy versus discreteness right. So, they behave like Japanese monolinguals and advanced learners will behave like where, where they, their choice of words depended on number marking because English provides number marking. So, they went by the categories whether it is animal versus it is uh, object whether it is substance. So, these pictures I will uh, add in the annexure uh, towards the end of the slides you can see. So, this study also showed that languages uh, do have an impact uh, on cognition even if to some degree even if to some degree as in you see here that uh, there is a difference between as your proficiency in your L2 goes higher the choice of words the choice of cards uh, choice of the matching also differs. So, this is a gradient process and uh, starting from monolingual uh, L1 monolingual behavior going through various stages to L2 monolingual behavior. So, this is about number. So, you have already seen gender marking uh, gender marking and number grammatical number marking on bilingual behavior. Next we will take up uh, tense marking and tense aspect marking as well as motion verbs in the next segment. Thank you. Mm -hmm.